give you salvation just to possess it. You and I are to become the Christians God saved us to become. God, please, and turn with me to the book of Jude, and we'll begin reading in just a moment in Jude with verse 20, this vestibule leading to the revelation of Jesus Christ, the book of Jude, a hallway God allows us to walk through before he reveals to us these amazing things in the last book of the Bible. God has put one purpose on my heart, and that is to enlist us I say it that way, enlist you, enlist myself in the wonderful work of telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. We live in a world of nearly 7 billion people. As a matter of fact, the United Nations and people who keep up with statistical things through that organization have set a day that they say the world will pass the 7 billion mark in population. But these masses of people mean nothing unless they're individualized. Nothing is real until it's personal. It must be personal. And that's the point I pray God will help me make in this brief message. The Bible says in verse 20 of Jude, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I want you to mark one word, please, in the 22nd verse, a very familiar verse, I'm sure. It is the word some. Some. This is a word for you. It's a word for me. Some. God could have said easily have compassion. But he says, and of some have compassion, making a difference. And others, saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. The human penman for this particular book of the Bible appears to be the child of Mary and Joseph who came along after the virgin birth of Christ. As a matter of fact, if you'd like to hold your place there just for a moment in your Bible and turn with me in the gospel records, you may wish to make note of this in Mark chapter 6, if you'll turn there please, in Mark chapter 6. The Word of God says, beginning with verse 1 in Mark chapter 6, and he went out from thence and came into his own country and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue and many hearing him were astonished saying, from whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Here Jesus, the Bible says, is in his own country. And they witness the mighty things that he does, being followed by this group who call him their teacher, They're his disciples. And someone who knew much about his family, his upbringing there in the village of Nazareth, said, how can this be? Isn't this the carpenter? Don't we we know his mother? Aren't we familiar with his brethren and his sisters? One of these brothers was named Judah, or Jude as he was referred to here, we believe, in this book that he has penned as he serves as a human penman 
under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Now I want you to notice as you return to the book of Jude, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called mercy unto you in peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. There's not a change of mind here as some people teach. He's writing about the common salvation and the faith which was once delivered. The faith once delivered must be contended for in every generation. And the point to be made here, especially as we look at the third verse in this book, is that if we're going to have the message of this common salvation, if we're going to hear of this common salvation, if people are going to hear the gospel, then every generation must contend for the faith. Now some people get the idea when they read this that he was going to write about salvation and change his mind to earnestly contending for the faith. That's not it at all. What he's declaring here is if we're going to have a gospel to preach, if there's going to be a message of common salvation, then it's going to disappear unless in each generation we do our part to contend for the faith. The greatest danger we face is the loss of the gospel message because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And if people are not being saved, one of two things has happened. Either the gospel has lost its power or people are not hearing it. Well, we know the gospel has not lost its power. And if people are not hearing it, it's because we are not earnestly contending for the faith with that message. There are many people who believe that the purpose of earnestly contending is to make as much fuss and do as much fighting as possible. I believe that I've had a responsibility given to me from the Lord to contend for the faith all of my Christian life. How do we contend? What is our greatest way of contending for the faith? I believe at the top of the list is the proclamation of the gospel. Now I believe that I am a separatist Baptist by conviction. And I believe that biblical separation is separation to the Lord and from the world. Christ crowds out the things that should not be in our lives. There's no doubt about that. Remember the story of Robert Dick Wilson who was a professor at Princeton Seminary years and years ago, one of the most intelligent men, one of the most intelligent theologians uh, in American theological history. He came one day to a chapel service at Princeton University, and of course it's been long ago, uh, to hear one of his students speaking. And the student was approached by this professor after he gave his message. The former student was back to speak, and he said, I wanted to hear you speak to determine whether you are a big God preacher or a little God preacher. And I've been very happy to hear you speak because I recognize that you are a big God preacher. Then he went on to tell this story. He said, there is a pin oak tree, a certain type of oak tree. It is a pin oak tree. It is the last of the oak trees to lose its leaves. And when you see the dead leaves hanging on that pin oak tree, you could take a stick and knock them off. You could try to climb its branches and shake them off. But if you wait until the sap begins to move and bring life back into that tree, the life moving in that tree will push the dead leaves off and bring life in its place. And there are many Christians, unfortunately, who have the idea that the Christian life is trying to rid yourself of everything. You know, you could rid your home of every evil thing and still not have a Christian home. You could stop all bad habits in your life and still not live a devoted Christian life. The Christian life is all to do with the place we give the Lord Jesus Christ. When he said to his disciples, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. If we're not fishing for men, then it's obvious we're not following Christ. 
Because if we're following Christ, He's promised to make us fishers of men. I could give a lecture right now on all, all the conditions of the world and how bad things are. As a matter of fact, the book of Jude deals with this. And it's necessary to talk about it. He talks about wicked people who've crept in unawares and those who are going to the blackness of darkness forever. And those things need to be declared. But then notice the first words in the 20th verse. He turns to God's people and says, But ye, beloved, but ye, we think we've satisfied everything God demands of us to cry out against everything wrong in the world. Matter of fact, we're very pleased with ourselves when we can talk about what we don't like about this, that, or the other, whether it's some political thing or some religious era. But most of the time, most of the time, we're trying to excuse our omissional sin because we are not the witnesses God has called us to be. How are people going to be saved if they do not hear the way of salvation? How? How will they ever know how to be saved? And who can tell them except those of us who can tell them except those of us who've been born again. A great church is not an evangelistic church. Does that shock you? As a matter of fact, I don't know where the great churches are and I've never claimed that this was one of them. But I do have this idea. A great church is not an evangelistic church that's proclaiming the evangelistic message, heralding the truth of God's word. A great church must be a church where individual members of that church have been trained, enlisted, equipped to be personal soul winners. And that's what my heart's desire is for my own life and for our lives, all of us. All of us. May God help us. I became a Christian as a 14-year-old boy, as you well know, from a broken home. My father was a professional gambler. My Mother was almost killed by my own father. When I came to Jesus Christ, I was the only Christian I knew of in my family. I was led to Christ by a personal soul winner. I wanted my family saved. I truly believed there was a real heaven and a real hell. I don't want to say I worried, but I was greatly troubled about my family going to hell. I wanted somebody to tell them. I tried to witness to them, but I wanted people to tell them. When they moved away and I stayed in the state of Tennessee and they moved to Florida to finish my last year in high school, God had really dealt with my heart and I'd surrendered my life to the Lord and I prayed that someone in Florida where they moved would be a witness to them. That they'd mean something to somebody. You know, it was, it was 14 years after my salvation that the first member of my family came to Christ my brother his wife is here it was many years after that that he was used of God to lead my mother to Christ but I was burdened and I'm going to be frank with you I would tell people if they ask I was burdened for the whole world but I wasn't hear me please but there were some people some people that had become so near and dear to me, I longed to see them saved. And I'm not going to ask you, any of you, uh, to look at the whole world. Uh, that becomes so impersonal. As a matter of fact, those kind of suggestions, even those kinds of prayers, God bless everybody serving you all over the world, they're, I think, nearly meaningless. But when we get specific and we talk about some some I want you to get your handful your some I want to get my handful my some that I know that I see that I hear that I visualize that I pray for that I work at getting the gospel to them to see them saved how many of you sweet people know what I'm talking about would you raise your hand it ought to start with your home and with your family, and with your children. 
perhaps with a special neighbor. Some, some, let's narrow it down. Let's bring it down to that some. Before I say just a word about this particular passage, I want you to turn with me back, please, to the gospel according to Mark, to chapter 9. In Mark chapter 9, beginning with verse 14, the Lord Jesus Christ had been on the Mount of Transfiguration. When he came down from the mountain, he found an argument going on with his disciples. The people who were causing the disturbance were not concerned about the needs of anyone. They just wanted to accuse the Lord Jesus and be right. Did you hear me? They just had to be right. And they are preachers, some of them, unfortunately, independent Baptist preachers. And churches, many of them independent Baptist churches, as we might say, fundamental independent Baptist churches, who seem to care nothing for lost souls. The only thing they want is to prove they're right. Well, I want you to know, you can prove you're right and still let the world go to hell. And the sum you and I should be concerned about die without anybody making an effort to get them to Christ. I don't want you to have that spirit. I don't want that spirit. I believe I ought to cross every fundamental T and dot every fundamental I. I believe that fundamentalism for me is synonymous with biblical Christianity and I want to be a biblical Christian. But my convictions are meaningless. Did you hear me? They're meaningless unless they're bathed with compassion and express the love of Christ. The love of Christ. I don't want this church to be viewed as the church that's right in town. I want this church to be viewed as the church where people sense the presence of Jesus Christ and are true followers of Jesus Christ and speak with people compassionately about the Lord Jesus they love. Amen. Is that what you want? Is it? If that's what we want, that's what each of us individually must become. In Mark chapter 9, beginning with verse 14, may the Lord speak to our hearts here. And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and running to him, saluted him, and he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit, and wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. I want you to sort of visualize this. I, I, I do this when I read the Bible. I hope you do. I think it's good. We may not always get this dramatization of it right in our minds, but Try to see, Christ has come down from the Mount of Transfiguration. He's been transfigured into the glorious likeness in which he shall appear someday. Moses and Elijah stood alongside him. Three disciples, Peter, James, and John, have been there with him. They're so excited they want to build a tabernacle there. 
Peter being their spokesman. They come down to the base of the mountain. And as they're there, they come upon a scene where there's lots of racket, proud, boisterous men talking. The disciples being argued at, perhaps arguing with, can't be sure about that, with these scribes. Now I want you to imagine what it was like for these disciples to be trying to help this man and his son and were coming up short. He's still the same, he's still the same, he's still the same and being mocked by these accusing scribes. Somebody there, God help us, somebody there needs to see the heart of this father and his son. The man is saying, Can somebody help us? Somebody have compassion on us? Please. This boy was no doubt unattractive. He nearly drowned. The father would go into the water to rescue him. You can imagine a boy convulsing like that and how how difficult it was just to get him out of the water, keep him drowning and No doubt there were times the father and son both almost lost their lives. He'd fall into a fire, and you know how terrible burns are. Perhaps his body was scarred. Everybody that knew him knew there was something wrong with him. He was a person constantly ridiculed. Even people who considered themselves to be decent people avoided him. This man needed help. He needed somebody to care enough to get involved in his life that could do something, that had the power to do something to change his son. You know, you and I get everything fixed up the way we like it, and we almost live a life avoiding people who aren't fixed up like we are. Instead of being separated to God and from the world, we we insulate ourselves from the world and isolate ourselves from people in need. Matter of fact, we don't want our families or our children, for the most part, to touch the unlovely or to be near them. And you wonder how God looks on it. I'm not just preaching to you. I'm preaching to myself. When's the last time you you drove down the road and saw someone who didn't have a car or walking about or or a mother? I say to my wife, and I'm not the caring, loving person I ought to be, but I say to my wife, My mother could never drive. My father was always gone. I see a woman walking to the grocery store down a busy street with children tagging alongside. I was out on Broadway the other day and saw a woman trying to cross a busy intersection with two little boys by her side. I said, there goes Ruby and Clarence and Tommy. That's the way it was. And those people are not to be avoided. They deserve the same heaven that we possess. They're loved to the same God who loves us with an everlasting love. That's the only way they'll ever hear about it. You say, these are people who don't care. These are people who don't have any character. These are people, now listen, don't come to those assumptions about all the human race, many times judging from your own rationale about the way you feel and think everybody else is like that. They're not. I looked in the faces of these young people 28 of them who made professions of faith in Christ today right here. And I looked in their faces, and I I know in many of their faces, if you'd been standing with the vantage point I have looking in their faces, you would have seen something easily seen in the lives of so many of them who were saying, give me the opportunity. I long to be worked with. I want to improve my life. I want to be what God wants. But it won't happen. It won't happen. Unless someone's moved with compassion and invest in the life of that person. You know how great this church is? We can see all these kinds of things happening and applaud in our heart and thank God and never, never get personally involved in the life or family of any one of those people. How many of you think that's right? How many of you think it's not right? Would you raise your hand? Well, then when will we change? You don't have to take them all. Just some. Just some. 
Mrs. Lawhorn made sure that I got to Sunday school. I'm sure it cost gas, money. <laughs> I'm sure it was inconvenient. She had to get dressed earlier, she and her husband, to come by my house. They lived way out in another section of town. There was 25,000 people in my hometown at the time. They didn't get after all 25,000 people, but I'm glad I was one of their some. When I got into an older class, Mr. Britton came by and picked me up in his station wagon. And he and his children, I know it was inconvenient. It took extra time. They had to go out of their way. They had to find me after church and bring me back home. I thank God I was one of their some. How do you get the point? Well, they're out there. And God help us, they're out there. And while we're building our palaces down here, while we're doing everything imaginable to improve our life here, we're passing through a world and by the lives of so many people who've never had the opportunity we have because no one's done for them what someone did for us. And we owe a debt, don't we? May God help us to pay it. And may I say this as kindly as I possibly can, I've been here a long time, and we would not have this church to this juncture if it weren't for many of you. And I could call your names who have been with me from day one, faithful, knocking on doors, going. But you have taken a seat, and you haven't gotten up, some of you, in a long, long time. And you need to determine that you're not going to finish in such a selfish way that you're going to get some you're going to stay after until they get, until they get saved. And I'm looking at you in the face and you know it. The Spirit of God, I'm as sure as I'm standing here, the Spirit of God is convicting some of your hearts about it. And may God help us. I want you to turn with me to the book of Jude just a moment. Thank God Jesus came and helped that poor man and his son. Notice he says, but ye, verse 20, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, if we're going to be able to do what God has commanded us to do, he's commanded that we care. Well, the audacity, excuse me, the audacity of God to disturb my comfortable life and command me to care. We won't care unless we're building up ourselves on our most holy faith. We've got faith to build on. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Notice keeping ourselves in the love of God. That has a whole lot to do with our attitude, if not everything to do with it. You see, this kind of life delivers us from all this littleness I've talked about recently. It helps us to see the Lord high exalted and lifted up. We're laboring together with God. This idea we had with Baptist Friends International, Truth, Friendship, World Evangelism. I'm not trying to get people to work together. That's, somebody's missed it. I'm trying to understand and get other people to understand how vital it is that we all work together with God. I'm not just asking a pastor, let's do something together. Let's try to win souls together. That's not it. We're working together with God. Did you know working with God is a world of difference from working for God? In order to work with God, we have to agree with God. Two can't walk together except they agree, and we all begin with the same truth. Surely we can come together with that, and we can work with God. Is God the most interested in the lost? Sure he is. And as we work with God, God guides us, helps us to be sensitive to the leading of His Spirit. He prompts us. He brings things and people to our mind. He helps us because He's made a difference in our lives to make a difference in the lives of others. You know that's true. Matter of fact, I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't know, but perhaps I'm reminding you of some things that we all need to hear again. And he says, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. We got our eyes on the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. If it were not for his mercy, well, we'd all be lost and on our way to hell, already in hell. 
Every one of us. Every one of us. Do you think God found us and said, what a lucky find I've made? No. No, it didn't work that way. God has blessed us and used us. I said to James Zinker, I was talking to him on the phone just before coming into this meeting, and he's in England. They had a great day. Had 138 people at their baptismal service yesterday and had a great day today with people saved. And I said, James, the greatest thing we come to as Christians is to see that God will use us, that God himself will use us, not because of talent and ability and training, but because of his mercy. God will use us. Most people that God is using in a great way if you can determine that or not determine it, but it, most people God is using, uh, someone would not have given a plug nickel for how God would have ever used them. But the Lord found someone or some, some person that could bring glory to Him by using them. And so now He's getting us ready for what He's about to ask us to do. And of some, and that's the point I'm making, some, find a handful, two, three, Four, five. We're going to every home in our community starting Saturday, doing it again, by the way. And we're going, and as we go, you know you'll be blessed by going, and you'll meet some people, and not everyone in the community, but some of those people will become the object of your prayers and your hard interest in getting them saved. And notice he lists these types of people. He says, of some have compassion, making a difference. Those are people that we must work with patiently, tenderly, kindly. Perhaps even for a long period of time. Nearly 20 years before my own mother came to Christ. She had to be diagnosed with cancer before she got interested enough to know how to be saved. And I'd say, don't I thank God for cancer? Isn't that a horrible thing for some people to hear? But I'm telling you, she would not be a Christian had she not had to think about dying without God, without hope. Patiently. There are people that you don't go and knock on their door and five minutes later lead them in a profession of faith. It just doesn't happen. They literally need to be loved all the way to Jesus over a long period of time. Then notice, please, he says, and... Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. That's people very near hell. But Peter and I were the other day at a home of a man who knew he didn't have much time left and he gave his heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I think this is the type of man that he's very near hell and we've got to press the point to him. You know, this is no time to dilly-dally around. If, you, if you're going to put your faith in Jesus Christ, God's been after you for years and he admitted that it's time right now. There's no time left. You need to come to Christ. And he needed to hear it just that way. Then there's a third group here where we have to be very careful. But some people get themselves into terrible trouble. He says, look at it please. Hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. There are some people so engaged in sin, so openly in rebellion to the Lord that if you just rush into their lifestyle, you could be tainted by the appearance of evil. And you must prayerfully, carefully do what you do. A lot of zealous Christians want to get out and just go anywhere, do anything, be seen anywhere because I'm here for God and I've lived long enough, I've been in the ministry long enough to have seen many of those people, men and women, get involved in the sin of the people they were trying to win to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we must pray about it. Ask God for wisdom with that sum. But may God help us. I'm going to ask you just straight up to do this one thing. May God help us all. You ask God to give you your son in whose lives God will use you to make a difference. And if someone asks you, can I help you pray for somebody that's lost? You would know immediately the names of the people because you've taken them in your heart and life. You find them. If you work with young people, it may be a handful of young people that you know need the Lord. 
It might be the mother and father of some child you're following up that's come to know Christ. It might be someone that's dear to your heart in your own family. But let's personalize this. Make it our business personally to seek the lost, embracing them for the love of Christ. Would you bow with me in prayer? Dear Lord, before I pray for these precious people, I pray for myself that you'd help me be the soul winner that I ought to be, a concerned Christian, a gospel witness. Help us not to be able to escape this and if some have compassion making a difference. Deal with us, dear Lord. Maybe, maybe not get so starry-eyed and big-ideaed and world-visioned that we don't all have our sum we're working on to bring to thee, Lord Jesus. In thy precious name we pray. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm here to work with you and you with me. We're about to take on a new effort, a greater effort. And uh, not just talk about it, Talk about the masses or the people in the whole. But ask God to help us get individually involved, personally involved with a handful of people that we're trying to get to Jesus. Before I ask you to respond, how many of you believe that you've heard and you understand what I pray God is helping me to speak? Would you lift your hand? Hold it high. Thank you so much. Now, by God's grace, how many of you will say, I'm going to ask the Lord to help me be that person who will of some have some that I can make a difference to be used of God, having compassion make a difference in their lives. Now, please, it's a response not just to me, but to the message I trust God is using on your heart. How many men and women and young people would say, that's me. Now, wait a minute. You say, I go to the University of Tennessee to witness every week. Or I go to the nursing homes to witness every week. Or I go to the Bible clubs to witness every week. Or I teach a Bible study and give the lesson to witness every week. I'm not talking about somebody seeing 26,000 students at the University of Tennessee. I'm talking about somebody seeing five or six people there they'll try to bring to Jesus. How many of you say, God helping me, I want to commit myself to to this sum. Would you lift your hand? Hold it high, would you please? Now please, may God help us. If you raised your hand, would you please stand? May God bless you people. And I'm so thankful I plan to preach on this while all our students are away. Because the work of God is not left to the students of Crown College in this church. It's left to God's people who are here, who are part of this church all the time. We can't ever let it happen any other way. And I thank God for you. I know we have people who have been saved and want to follow the Lord in baptism. I want you to leave your place now and just come and let one of the workers pray with you. We'll get that cared for. And all the rest of you who will come and say, to the Lord, this is to God. I want you to take the time. I want you to take the time. They're going to play a little of all to Jesus, I surrender. I want you to leave your place, come and find a place to pray and say, Jesus, I want to do this for you. I want to do this for you. Help me to get this sum, this handful of people, and if some make a difference, with compassion make a difference. Come and tell the Lord, would you? Just leave your place and come and do it. And uh, don't block the aisle if you can. Keep from it. God bless you. We can encourage one another so much. Some of you are in the jails. You know we're in every jail in Knox County, Anderson County. What about following them up? God bless you.
See if they can get them through the aisles there, will you please? Good. Good. Now, before you start to pray, I want you to look at me just one moment, would you please? Now, listen to me. Mrs. Lawhorn was not a leader in her church, but she took me. Mr. Britton was not the pastor of the church, but he took me. God used it to make a difference in my life. You understand? We mustn't sit around and say, the pastors want to do this. No, no, no. There are people that you can help that no one else in the world can help but you. He's already put them in your path. Don't you thank him for that? Ask him to use you. Now let's pray about it right now. Would you please, while they're playing a little of this, let's pray about it. We're going to help these young people.